I got just a quick announcement. Watiska is an independent chapter of the National Audubon with a geographical area stretching through 17 counties in southeast Nebraska. The organization mission includes bringing people together to learn about and protect tall grass prairies as important habitats for birds and other wildlife, promote birding, and advocate for the natural community that includes human beings. You can track what's happening through Watiska's website and Facebook page and learn how to join in activities and events. This is a reminder that presentations are posted on YouTube. And now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's presenter. Uh, Chase Hardwig grew up just south of Lincoln in Cortland. He graduated from Northwest Missouri State University with a degree in wildlife ecology. He started work at Rock Creek Fish Hatchery after graduation uh, with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission and then accepted a full-time position at the North Platte State Fish Hatchery in 2019 with the commission. He enjoys hunting, fishing, reading historical bibliographies and going to the local gym, but tonight he's gonna to talk about a different kind of muscles. Chase is involved in uh, uh, the muscle program and is a member of the muscle team. Tonight he will tell us about Nebraska's native freshwater mussels propagation and reintroduction program. Chase, take it away. Awesome, thank you, Mark. Uh, I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. I appreciate the introduction. Um, let me get this up and running. And I'm gonna take my video off just cause I don't like looking at myself when I'm presenting, if I can. There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna start off. Um, we're gonna talk about freshwater native mussel production in Nebraska. Um, and also a little bit about their life history. Okay, so why are we propagating and releasing mussels? Um, right here, the numbers tell you what's going on. In Nebraska, we have 30 native species with about half of them actually having a population and then the other half being extirpated from the state, which I like to add that we haven't been able to do a study since 1990. So there's probably more extirpated species within the state of Nebraska. And this isn't a, just a statewide thing. This is a nationwide as you can see the numbers for the nationwide mussel species. Okay, so there's human impacts and then there's also environmental impacts. But for human impacts, there's pollution naturally, there's a lot of trash in the waterways of mussels reside, but also with farmers using herbicides and pesticides uh, nowadays, they apply it to their crops, but I mean, they can apply it, but there will be runoff of the herbicides and pesticides and that all leads to somewhere and some of it ends up in rivers and streams where mussels are. They're tough and they can tolerate a lot, but they can't always withstand everything. Also fragmentation, um, before I get to fragmentation, I'd just like to say that mussels require a, a fish host to reproduce. There are some species that reproduce on their own, but mussels are, their larvae are a parasite to the fish and they require the the fish host to reproduce. So with fragmentation, it's just the installment of low head dams, which actually just cuts off the muscle from the fish host. Cause you know, fish move upstream to spawn. So it cuts off the host from the muscle. And then some of you may know, but there's that over harvest of mussels back in the day when everybody wanted the buttons or to make buttons out of mussels. And the economical value for mussels just because of buttons, but also people will like to eat and indulge mussels. So for environmental impacts on the freshwater mussels, there's naturally there's drought. I mean, these mussels don't have legs. They can't up and cross to another waterway. So that's a, something they have to deal with, but also siltation. We see this when we're doing surveys of freshwater mussels in the rivers and creeks. We'll see banks um, actually eroding. There'll be a lot of runoff. Like I said, mussels can't just get up and move. So there'll be a little bit of runoff and that mud and silt and substrate will fall on top of mussels and they can't get out. Some can survive it. Some can tolerate more sediment falling on top of them. But also there's predation. Like they're all part of the mussels are part of the food chain. So they also they feed others like raccoons and river otters. But we've seen it where we've went to survey a <clears throat> river or stream that we've stocked that raccoons have just made a pile of uh, mussel shells they've indulged in. So why are native mussels important? They're a native fauna. Um, when we go back and survey uh, mussels, 
we've stocked, we'll see, or actually old brood, we'll see that mussels will have algae growth on them, which this is a good habitat for macroinvertebrates. Um, they're a good indicator. Mussels are a good indicator of the water quality of the rivers and streams. I mean, if you see abundant, healthy looking mussels, you can assume the water quality is good. But if you see mussels that are just shells and you don't find any, it probably could predict there's something going on with the water quality. Um, what they do is they filter out bacteria and E. coli. But also, they're low man on the totem pole, but they're all part of the food chain. So if you take them out of the food chain, stuff above them and below them will be affected. Like, like I said, they filter feed, so they filter out bacteria and they indulge it. They discharge of their waste and some other macroinvertebrates will come along and eat that. And then, so just giving food to people below them. Um, a little bit of life history, I've went on about filter feeding. But also the female will filter out um, milt and sperm from the male muscle, and that's how she gets fertilized. So growth, people at our last meeting were asking about growth and lifespan. So growth, um, I would say most of the growth comes within the first couple of years of uh, production. Most likely when they're juvenile, they grow the size. But there's also multiple factors that go in. There's water quality, there's stress handling. But as you can see here on the muscle, there's these rings. And the rings are kind of just, people call them growth rings, but they're not an indication of yearly because sometimes those rings can be produced by stress or by handling. And the muscle size can vary depending on the species, like a giant floater. I mean, that's probably seven to eight inches. And then there's other smaller uh, muscle species. And the lifespan kind of varies depending on the multiple factors I listed off, stressors, water quality, handling, and also depends on the species. And there have been documents of uh, mussels living to be 100 years old. So here's just a cool slide of the 30 different mussels within the state of Nebraska. I like this because they're, I mean, they're all relics, they're all shells, but they're all clean. And they're kind of easier to identify because sometimes when you get out the survey, you get algae growth on them. You can't hardly identify them, but mussels come in all different shapes and sizes, as you can see here. Okay, so Steve Shanist, he was a naturalist for the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. He worked for the rivers and streams for about 30 to 40 years, I believe. I can't remember off the top of my head, but he did mussel surveys. He'd always stop along rivers and creeks and do surveys. And he is the man. He is the reason why we know what we know about what's in the state of Nebraska for freshwater mussels. He also did crayfish surveys. So he told us all the distribution of the mussels. He, he's the teacher to all of us. But he, here's his list of species for recovery and reintroduction, all the way from a yellow sand shell that has a population all the way to black or black sand shell that is extirpated. But we're just going to worry about the yellow sand shell, the plain pocketbook, fat mucket, and the black sand shell. So these next couple of slides are just the distribution throughout the state of Nebraska for the mussels that we're raising right now with the game and parks. So first off, this is the plain pocketbook. And as you can see in the northeast corner, um, the orange circles, that is a live uh, specimen. And I'd like to note that this is the only species of mussel that we have that we collect brood for so we can produce, so we get them in state so we can produce offspring. Um, and this is on the Elkhorn River actually, but the other species of mussels we get, we get from Kansas, Missouri, and Wisconsin, and they come from state and federal, state and or federal hatcheries. Next up is the fat mucket. There was a live specimen found in the Southeast corner of Gage County. But that, I would like to add that that was found in 1990. So I feel confident saying that when we uh, went and stocked our first fat muckets, I would say that it was extirpated from the state. And we get fat muckets from uh, Kansas. And then this is the black sand shell. It was extirpated from the state, but just last year in 2021, we were able to produce about 600 of these. So it's pretty exciting to be able to bring back a, a muscle that was extirpated from the state. 
Um, the first uh, species that we worked with was a plain pocketbook. We started in 2014. And like I said, we got that brood from the Elkhorn River in the northeast corner. Um, and then things started going along well. And then we started trying to produce the, the fat mucket in 2016. And like I said, we get that brood from Kansas. And then this is just a quick slide of the two different species, just so you can kind of see a little difference. Um, when I started in 2019, my boss, uh, Brian Street, he said, a uh, good indication of how to identify these is distinct opposite. Because, I mean, two is kind of easy to identify apart, but you think fat mucket, you th want to think the muscle's big, round, and fat, but actually the plain pocketbook, which is on the left, it's, it's shorter and it's fatter. It's got more of a width. It's kind of hard to tell on this 2D picture, but it's got more width to it. And then on the right is the fat mucket, and it's longer and narrower. So I always just tell people to think different, think opposite, and <laughs> that's how I tell them apart. So going into the production side of things, so on the bottom here is the actual the female brood. But like I said before, the male and female will sit close to their, closely to each other in the rivers or stream. The male will release his sperm or milk. And then the female will uh, filter that through to get fertilized, and then she'll produce the larva. So as you can see on the bottom photo, that's the brood female. And you can see that exterior tissue she has, and that's what she calls the lure. And she'll actually move that to attract the fish, the fit, fish host. And then once the fish attaches onto the muscle, she'll release the glochidia larva, which you see to the left. I call them little Pac-Man because they look like both their valves open little Pac-Man. What they do, those glochidia larvae will attach onto the fish host and then uh, attach onto its gills. You see in that top photo right here, there's some white pigment. That is actually the glochidia larvae, and that's a good sign, especially when we're doing our production. Um, so then the glochidia are on the fish, and it's about two to three weeks, and that's dependent on species. And then They'll release off the fish, and as you see to the right, and they're closed, and then it's just natural selection from there. And then this is just a quick slide of the different fit host fish there are. These are the four species we've done within the state at uh, the game parks, but there's a lot of common largemouth bass, walleye, different carps of or different species of catfish. But what you, we usually use is just largemouth bass and walleye. It's pretty easy to get that stuff when we work at that hatchery. But then also the pistol grip, we use flathead catfish. And here's just a quick blown up photo of the female brooder. So like I said, on the left, the photo on the left, there's that exterior tissue, which is just the, um, just the lure. And then on the right, you can see here on the top, this is the, actually the marsupial gill, which houses the glochidia larva. And then here's a good video of the lure actually in action. And you can kind of see how that motion would attract a host fish. Okay, so for us, we do our artificial inoculation. So there's the four easy, four easy steps for our process. It's extraction, viability testing, enumerating, and infestation. So the first step is extraction. So we take that female brooder, we'll open up with priors, pliers, and then we'll insert a cork or a plug to keep her pride open. And then on the picture on the top left, you'll see a syringe which is just filled with water. And we actually puncture that marsupial gill, which houses the glochidia larva, and then we'll flush the marsupial gills. And that's how we get the larva out of the brood muscle. And here's a, our viability testing. This is just a test we do real quick with like one milliliter of the larva we get out of it, just to test to make sure the glochidia are alive, they're moving, they're functioning. So what we do is we drop a little bit of salt on them under a dissecting scope. So then we can see the, the each valve close shut. So that is a positive sign that they're alive and we can further use the other 
Black kitty larva to put on the fish. And there goes the salt. And you kind of see how each valve closes. So that's a good sign. So we'll go ahead and then do the infestation step. Or actually, we'll do the enumerating step. I got ahead of myself. So enumerating, this is basically us taking one milliliter of that glochidia larva in the beaker. And we'll put it on our egg counter, which are oh, went too far ahead. Which our egg counter is just a photo on the right. So we'll put one milliliter of the larva on there, and we'll put it under the dissecting scope, and that allows us to figure out how much larva is in one milliliter of sample. So then we can figure out how much, how many milliliters we need to put on the fish. So here's an infestation step. This is kind of crucial, the big step, but here on the um, left, we actually take the cooler, which we use bigger coolers nowadays. We put water in there, the fish in there, and then the X amount of milliliters of the glochidia larva. And we put a blower in the cooler, which just stirs up everything in the cooler. So then the fish is getting all that glochidia in the, through its system. And we do that for about 15 minutes. And then occasionally throughout, we'll check the fish like we see here in the middle, and we'll see that white pigment, which is a good sign, which means the glochidia larva are getting onto the fish. And then after two or three days, we'll put them out in the pond. But on the photo on the right is just a cross section of a gill filament, which you can see two muscles and capsules inside of the gill filament. So we do this process, this four step process in May, and then we take the infested fish with the glochidia larva and we'll put them out in our ponds at the hatchery which our ponds are one acre earthen ponds. And we'll put the fish in cages to kind of keep them in one corner of the pond. And then in two to three weeks, the, the glochidia larva will fall off the mussel. And then we'll drain the pond in late September, early May, which is usually just our grow out pond, one of the last ponds we uh, drain for the season, just so that it gives the mussel time to grow and for us to go out and pick them up. So here's the fun part. This is the collection. Everybody's anticipating picking these up. So on the top right is the kind of a half photo of the, the muscle basket or the cage we keep the fish in. And in a perfect world, all that glochidia larva will fall off the fish and fall right under the cage and it'll be smooth sailing from there and will be easy to pick up. But I've seen it. We've had it just, just last year where we were picking up mussels from one side of the pond to the other side of the pond. And that's basically us just in our waders crawl around on our hands and knees picking up mussels and then we send that bucket full of mud and mussels through the sifter just so we could separate them and here's a video of us picking up mussels and you can kind of see how the mussels can be spread out across the pond there's the mussel baskets trouble so yeah usually that's like a two-day process everybody's jacked and ready to go the first day and then the second day everybody's our mood kind of changes so here's the production numbers by year so like i said i started out with the plain pocketbook and then we went to the fat market and there's pretty good production in 2019 the first year i was there was a big production year which is good to see, that's what we're going for. We wanna see big production years. But we still have muscles from 2019 still. I believe in 2020, 2020, we tried raising black sand shells, but something happened. We either, we didn't get the fish out in the pond and the muscles released before we get around the pond or the fish we had got sick. I can't quite remember. But in 2021, we did plain pocketbook, fat mucket, and then we also were able to raise black sand shells. So after we get the mussels out of the pond, we enumerate them, get a rough idea of how many there are, and then we do the mussel storage, which is basically us just getting laundry baskets, as you can see in the top right, and we put a black tarp in the bottom so nothing falls out of the bottom, and then we put mud or 
earthen dirt on top, which is just a sub a sediment for the muscles uh, or a substrate for the muscles to live in. And we've had changes throughout the time with the muscle baskets. Um, we've developed, we had used to have the baskets and just pool noodles. So then the baskets floated, but then I believe they went to having the basket and then like a piece of foam on top, which is just pink board, which covers it and allows the basket to float. And then having a cement anchor on the bottom, but we kind of strayed away from the cement anchor because as you can see in the bottom left, that's a lot of baskets. And that's a lot of carrying around and a lot of going from point A to point B. But now what we do is we take those, our muscle baskets, our laundry baskets, and we zip tie two together at the handle. And we put that zip tie through a, a post in the water and we submerge them. And then, so the baskets just sink, but we make sure they're submerged into the mud so they don't roll over. But we will usually, what we've always done, I believe, is just brought the mussels up to Valentine fish hatchery for over winter, because for some reason they strive up in Valentine. So they, you see good growth. And then in the spring, we'll bring them back down the North Platte. So tagging, tagging is just us putting our brand on the mussel. It's for us to be able to identify the mussel after when we go surveying. So what we have is we have glue dots. Um, we put on each side, each valve, which the plain pocketbook will get a white dot and then the fat mucket will get a black dot. They've done hull prints in the past, but I believe that was just for a UNL study. And then we put pit tags on some of the muscles, not on all of them, but this is just so then when we go and survey, we can find muscles and be able to collect data. And then, like I said, in 2019, there was one, the big production year. We did one no mark mass stocking and we did that in Beatrice on the big blue. And we did that because we had so many in 2019 that we, our main goal is just to get them out there. That's the whole goal. Just get, be able to give them the fighting chance. And here's our stocking numbers by year. As you guys see, it kind of correlates with the previous production year. And after 2019, um, we've been just trying to get as many muscles out as possible. And it, it's kind of weather dependent. Because I remember when I was starting in 2019, we couldn't get muscles out because of the big floods that were going on. So that kind of set back us being able to stock. But also I'd like to add in 2020 and 2021, we gave Wyoming 5,000 plain pocketbook because the Wyoming game and fish is trying to doing what we're trying to do and which is just bring back their muscle uh, numbers and try and bring back their populations. So surveying, Surveying is just a chance for us to check the condition of the rivers and creeks. Sometimes after we go stock, everything looks great. Muscles are doing great, but sometimes we'll go back and the creek or river will be dry. Stuff will change. There'll be siltation. We can't find any of the mussels or the raccoons or predation or raccoons got to them. But also ultimately we're surveying to check the mussels. So we're checking for survival rate, checking for growth, and then checking for fertility to see if that female is gravid or and also sexing them. But as you can see here in the photos, there's one guy running the wand with the reader. There's one guy recording all the data, one guy doing the measurements with the calipers, and then a couple of guys that are digging up the muscles actually. And then these are just photos from Essing Creek. This is a good creek. Everybody loves this one. Um, muscles seem to do really well here. They strive well. They're easy to find. It's good substrate for them. But and also this Messing Creek is just south of North Platte by an hour. So it's super easy to get to, super convenient for us to go down and survey. And the mussels do really good there. Okay, so here's our primary st streams and sites. Um, this is just what we started out with. There's four different sites. I mean, Four different streams, but there's multiple sites on each stream. As you can see, there's Messy Creek, which is just south, and then there's Rose Creek, which is by Fairbury, which is kind of close to some of you. And then here's our secondary streams and sites. As you can see, there's a lot more streams I got added, a lot more sites, and this can kind of be hectic for some of us because there's only a certain amount of people we have on staff for this muscle project on the muscle team, and only ultimately our Main goal is we're fish production. We do fish production first, but so we only have so many hours to get out, do, do muscle work. 
but also, like I said, it's weather dependent. I mean, usually when we're wanting to go survey, it starts to downpour and it floods, so we can't get out. But um, here's just a slide of what we're over. We just overwintered. Like I said, there's uh, mussels from 2019, and there's then there's all the numbers from 2021. Okay, so this past year, we actually contracted out to a company to make us a database because prior to us having the database, everybody had, well, not everybody, but we had all these Excel files with all our survey data, all the uh, lengths, measurements, all the pit tag information. And I had a lot of information. Joe Cassidy up in Northeast Corner at Grove had a lot of stuff. Brian Sweet had some stuff. Marcus had some Excel sheets. So it was all cluster and everything was all over the place. So we created this database just to fix that clutter and allow us to get all our data under one house. So that everybody can access it and share it. And also allows us to be able to pinpoint our stocking sites. Our database, I believe is gonna be like, kind of like ArcGIS where actually everything's to scale, allows us to actually pinpoint where we're stocking our muscles. And ultimately it's gonna be like a individual report card for the muscles. It'll be able to pick up whatever muscle, pick it out, be able to see if it's alive, dead, if the female's gravid and see how many times we found it, what the growth is like on it. So it, the database has kind of saved us. It fixed the clutter. Okay, and we've had a lot of help from Biomark. Um, when we're doing our surveys, we're using those readers and wands. Those are coming from Biomark. And we also buy our pit tags from them. Um, previously, when we used the, our wand there, as you can see here in the bottom photo in both of them, it the reader head has probably about 16 inches in diameter, but the reader would actually read probably about two feet in diameter. And it doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're trying to find something that's about the size of a golf ball, it can kind of be pretty hard to find. So we worked with them. Baromarkt has uh, made some different wands for us. And uh, they actually been able to take that wand and read in a smaller area about the size of a baseball. So it's made it more convenient for us to be able to find the muscles in the rivers and streams. Okay, so going forward, um, our plan is to do another production year of the Fat Bucket and Plain Pocketbook. And then after that, we're going to start uh, propagating the Black Sand Shell, the Yellow Sand Shell, and the Pistol Grip Mussels. And also, we're going to start applying for grants. Most of our funding has come from SWIG grant, which is just from the US or Federal Fish and Wildlife. But we also get NET money from the lottery. So... We're just gonna apply for more grants so we can go out and survey and do more production. And here's just a quick slide of the muscle team. Um, I'm just one of the guys on the team. I'm just here presenting, but without these guys, we wouldn't be able to do this. And it's a lot more manpower, extra hours we put into our days, but I, you don't need to memorize them, just like to, you read over them, just to know that there's a lot of man hours that are going into this. And without these guys, it probably wouldn't be possible. And then without further ado, if you guys have any questions or comments, I'd gladly accept them. Um, here at the bottom is my email. So if you want to email me or whatever, and that phone number is actually the hatchery number. But also, I'd like to say thank you for allowing me to do this and be able to share about muscle production. But without further ado, if anybody has a question, let me know. Okay, we'll open up for questions. I see Dean Cole has a question. He's got his hand up. So, Dean. Yeah, Chase, uh, you talked about the Blue River. And again, I'm here at a Holiday Inn in Gallup, New Mexico, and it's the Zoom is kind of a slow process here. So yeah. forgive me if I'm re repeating a question here. But how far south on the Blue River from Beatrice have you been working? I noticed you mentioned that you were doing some work in Beatrice at the Muscles. And the reason I asked, I'm doing a lot of volunteer work along the Chief Standing Bear, Be Standing Bear Trail along that Blue River. And we have a lot of access from Fight Park to the uh, over by the dam area and all of that. So I was just wondering how far south are you going? Um, we're not actually that far. We're actually still in Beatrice when we're, when we're doing that. I'm trying to think of what park that is. It's just on the southwest corner of Beatrice by all the baseball fields. So yes. That stretch on that, on that dam right there or that bridge, I'd like to say. I think that's like a highway. Yes, sir. Highway, highway 6. Yes, no, not six. No, uh, it, it uh, 106, 106, I think it is. But yeah, we're just 136. 136. Oh, yeah. When you 
when you're on that bridge and you look to the south, there's that island sometimes. Yep. That's where kind of where we're we're stalking them just because that's when I was down there surveying, it was full of sand, good substrate. But also I'd like to add around Beatrice, we give mussels, well, we bring mussels for uh, the feds to stock at Cub Creek, which is just a homestead national monument. And that Cub Creek just runs right besides the national monument. So right. Well, I just, just, just for your reference, they're at Blue Springs too. They're just south of the dam. There's an island. There's all kinds of stuff. You have very good access at Fight Park. Plus, we've got, a, we've got four master nationalists down there that are very much involved. So just for your reference, if you need any help or assistance, okay. uh, that's a good area that people will work with you. Awesome. Appreciate it. That'd be awesome. I'll okay, get to so Mark my contact information if you want to ever contact me. And yeah, that, that. I'd really, I'd really appreciate that, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Mark Van Rugen, we'll we'll put you in. Yeah, I just so you said all the uh, mussels got out and you had to go chasing them around the bottom of the pond. How did that happen? What what's oh. why would you why did you think they wouldn't? And then why did they? Okay, so actually, let me just clarify. That's the whole purpose. They're supposed to get out of the cage when we're, they're in the pond just because our ponds are enclosed. I mean, there's no way for the mussel to actually be drained out. That's just so us. We put the fish in the cage in hopes that the mussels will fall off in that corner so we can go and pick them all up. But, I mean, sometimes they travel and they get across the pond, so – they're supposed to be able to fall out of the cage. We just put the fish in the cage just to kind of keep them in one local area. Within so they're the moving on their own, the muscles. Yeah. Yep. Okay, Marilyn McNabb, did you have your hand up there? Yeah, I wanted to say that I didn't think I would be interested in this presentation. <laughs> I think it was totally fascinating and really well done. And uh, thank you so much. You're, you're a good storyteller. Uh, <laughs> And the pictures are great. And uh, the whole thing is a world that most of us don't know. At least I don't know anything about. But it was really fascinating. Thanks, Chase. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, yeah, I'd like to add our head honcho, Dean Rosenthal. He always says his best. He's just like, he's just so interested by muscles. He just thinks it's the coolest thing. They don't have a brain. They don't have any appendages. <laughs> it's just crazy. And all the factors that go in for them to be able to reproduce naturally, it's just yeah. crazy because it seems like the odds are just totally against them. Glenn, you had a question? Yeah, uh, there's there are different species of mussels. Do they each fit in a particular uh, ecosystem? Do they all have, each have a, a different way of, of uh, habitat? I would say since they're not all competing with each other, are they for the same food? Yeah, I would say – not everyone, there might be some, that's a good question not off the top of my head. I don't know if there's one species that has a, a unique substrate they belong to, but when we go and survey, there are these rivers and creeks, there's quite a few species we'll pick up, just they're naturally there and they kind of live together. So you, it's not uncommon to see species in the same waterways together. Dwayne, you've got a question? Do you find those mussels in the plaque? Yeah, and that's actually where um, um, Wyoming, like I said, we give a uh, plain pocketbook uh, mussels to Wyoming. That's where they're actually stocking mussels is in the upper plat. Well, Wyoming. I know there was some, some certain vandals uh, of, the, of the human type that were raccoons that back in about 1960, uh, we got a lot of mussels and we didn't know what we were picking up. Uh, I shouldn't say we, those guys didn't know what they were picking up out of that <laughs> pond. But uh, we we had a whole gunny sack full and put them in the back of the superintendent's pickup. And I said, we again, yeah, they keep screwing up. Uh, but, the statue but, of limitations uh, has run, Dwayne. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we found them in what's now Bader Park, the, the, the park that the Whitney's developed off the Platte River by Chapman. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. And I like sharing all my stuff, what I do with my dad. My dad always tells me stories about when he was a kid. He's like, yeah, we'd be walking the rivers and creeks and whatever, and they were everywhere. But now it's just, that's not the case anymore. It's just populations are declining and we're trying to help that out. Troy, I think you had a question, Troy. I have a 
question. Okay, go ahead, Bertha. Um, how long do they live and what do they eat? And I don't know if you've ever been to Pennsylvania to the French Creek one, but I understand they have to be in, they're a filter of the water system and it has to be a really good water system for them to survive. But what do they eat? Um, they just eat algae or they eat bacteria and E. coli. So they are filter feeders. So they filter out E. coli and bacteria and that's what they mainly eat on. And for how long they live, it's kind of, it depends on species. Um, and also depends on other factors like um, the water quality, um, how long they've been handled or any other stressors. I mean, there might be a, a creek that has plenty of water flow and then it'll be a drought and they might live through it, but then it'll fill up and that might shorten their lifespan going forward. But so it kind of depends on all of that. Thank you. Yep. Okay, Troy, Troy, you have a question? So um, do you want, uh, is it helpful to have farm ponds to, to do your uh, experimenting with or um, uh, spring fed um, water uh, estuaries that are, I can't think the right word, but it's uh, uh, goes into the Blue River, um, the big blue tributaries for the Blue River, um, places like that to help. Uh, do your uh, research. Do you want uh, gravel bottoms? Do you want a, a flow from the pond or just aeration? Uh, so, sorry, I didn't mean to cut it out. Do you have any more, sir? No, that's good. Okay, so we use the ponds just to be able to for production, just so then we can produce them. And then they're in that contained area so we can pick them up. And then we keep them in our ponds or, well, we keep them over winter and Valentine just to keep them growing. But when we're doing our stocking, we like to put these mussels in the, in the blue or tributaries to the blue, Elkhorn, Nemaha, all the main uh, rivers and streams. Now, or just put them on the tributaries of the big rivers and streams like close by because that's where you most likely will find the uh, fish hosts that they require. So that's kind of what we're doing. Like, I have an idea to put uh, mussels on the Turkey Creek by DeWitt, Nebraska, just because that's close to the blue. So it, the Turkey Creek's a tributary of the big blue, but that's what we like to do, just put them where the host fish are most likely to be. But also, when we're looking for places to put these, when we're surveying the rivers and creeks, Preferably, man, it'd be nice to be able to put them in sand because when we go out digging, our fingernails are just raw <laughs> from the gravel and everything. So when we dig in sand, it's preferred, but I know how the world works. Everything's shifting, changing. Rivers and creeks don't always stay the same. So we have to put them in gravel sometimes. I mean, when Marcus, my coworker, he knows when we go to the Big Blue River on uh, by Beatrice, oh, it's just, we have to bring like little garden shovels just to be able to dig in it because it's just so rocky which they they survive in it which is crazy they get down into between the rivers or the rocks but yeah we take anything and just mainly we're trying to put the mussels where the host fish are most likely to be chase uh, how do they uh, attach to the gills do you know the mechanism how they attach and then they, they're able to release in three weeks do you know how they attach um what they do is i'm guessing when they're that just that bivalve when they're the pac-man and like you see when we add that salt they close i'm yeah. guessing they just sense they're close to where they need to be and they just close on to that gills and they just stay there for two three weeks and that's when they live off the the finish their larval stage and then they fall off okay any other we questions to, we used to go canoeing on the elkhorn up above fremont and it was not clean i'm just i just wonder where you you know, where do you do this? Where do you find clean creeks? <laughs> um, I, I'm not, and I'm not going to lie to you. When we go survey, most of these rivers and creeks are not clean. There, we go the Shelf Creek, which is by, man, what's that by? Newman Grove, that area. 
and it is just i basically it's just a pivot runoff and there's so much trash in there it's gross but i mean muscles live in it so we'll just keep stocking them give them a chance but on the elkhorn i believe we stock or we find those brewed up by o'neill uh joe mm-hmm. Cassidy, he's at the grove hatchery he goes and find the brood over by there on the Elkhorn. So, and I don't know what it looks like up there, but I'm not surprised some of these rivers or creeks are gross and not clean at all. Chase, do you like, care if I, do you, sorry, do you care if I add some to that? No, you go right ahead. Go right ahead. I was just going to point out um, a common misconception that's even hard for fish guys to understand when you're in water all the time is clean isn't necessarily clear um so you know even a muddy creek or a muddy river while it might not look clean it might not possess some of those pesticides herbicides stuff like that to a higher level but it does have a lot of primary production which is what these mussels are feeding on for food so this is kind of another weird thing to think about that just because you can't see through it like drinking water um, doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad stream for a mussel well, it used to just reek, but I suppose maybe if it's cattle dung or whatever, maybe that's stuff they like. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised, but thank you, Mark. appreciate that. Uh, Dean, you've got another question? Yeah, I just, again, want to emphasize to Chase, please consider down there by Blue Springs because the sand is softer, the people are nicer, <laughs> the rock is easier, plus you've got Bill's Creek tributary coming in there you got wildcat you've got indian creek you got all kinds of things down there so yeah, and they're, you. they're people are much that. nicer than in beatrice I and uh, I appreciate that. and i'm from Cortland, so usually when we do that ah! southeast corner we go out we go out there and we stay at my old man's place and spend a lot of time down there well i just want to i just because we would love to work with you i know of about four people that would work with you on all of that stuff. So again, just keep it in mind. So greatly. And yeah, and this publicity, just getting our word out there is perfect. We appreciate it being able to do this and actually getting people involved because it's just, it's something different. And it's, no, I never this thought I'd be doing this. This is great. Thank you. Yep. Of course, sir. Well, maybe take another question or two. It looks like Mark's got another question. Mark. It looked like from your map, you weren't doing much in the panhandle. Um, are there places there that mussels can do okay, or is that some other reason? Um, Marcus, if you have anything to add on this, go ahead. But I think this might be just limited because that those maps were from Steve Shanist. And I'm not sure because I've never talked to the guy, but I don't know if this is just because he wasn't able to go that far west out because he was a rivers and streams guy. And I mean, majority of it is on the south or the eastern side of the state. But I know going forward, um, we're looking at doing a chunk. What is that creek, Marcus? The Horse Creek? Uh, yeah, Horse Creek. Yeah, and that's over by where is it? I wish um, I oh, I got it. It's clear clear on the western part of the panhandle. Like so yeah, we are going to be starting to do some surveys and stocks out there because the Horse Creek, I believe, is somehow connected up above – a creek or stream that's in Wyoming that they're planning on stocking. So for going out West, I think it's just kind of, we haven't done many surveys out West and I wouldn't doubt it if there's mussels out there, but we just haven't had the time to go out and we don't have the archeological data or the history on surveys out there. What happens when the, I mean, it seems like we have so much drought. What happens? Do they actually go down into the mud and they can make it through a drought time or um i don't know about making it through a drought time but sometimes i've we've seen it where they can probably sense it there's something's coming the water level's getting low and they'll go deeper and that's probably the best chance they got and if it's too much of a drought for them they'll probably dry out and that's it but also they kind they do move it's just not so fast i mean like i said they don't have legs they can't just up and move it's it's kind of a process for them so and also what we've seen on the other side of a drought was when there's a heavy rainfall but we went to go stop or survey the next day um the mussels are deep it's just crazy they sense they must sense that the rain is coming that the water level is getting high the, there's going to be probably maybe more of a flow so they go down deeper and they just anchor down and they hold on so 
Chase in the chat, uh, Ross Scott mentions of all the creeks that he's walked in that Turkey Creek in Saline County is where he's seen the most mussels. <laughs> that's good to hear because that's that was some of my dad suggested going forward because that was one he was always in as a kid, so he always seen abundant uh, supply of mussels there. Well, let's go for one more question. Someone have one last question here, uh, Ross? Go ahead. Just just his, historically, the Native Americans depended a lot of their diet depended upon mussels, and if you get out on uh, village sites, sometimes along rivers and creeks, they're built up with mussel shells, just mussel oh, shells all over. And they really? used ground up shells to temper their pottery. Huh, There's, really? That's cool. If you, if you study it down in Kansas, they, a lot of the, the Native Americans used mussel shells to temper their pottery. Oh, that's cool, really cool. And Chase, I'll bring it back to birds. Did you guys see any birds out there when you drained those ponds out there collecting and eating oh. those uh, clams ahead of you or not? <laughs> Uh, just a couple, a lot of seagulls. I'm not good. I ain't going to lie. I'm not really that good at bird identification, but yeah, we have a whole slew of seagulls out there, especially when we're doing like our walleye draining, not just when we're doing our mussel draining, but yep. when we do our walleye soccer and all that, when we do those, cause there's minnows in there, that's what feeds the walleye and everything. So the seagulls are always there just flocking the ponds, but. Okay. Well, with that, Chase, I want to thank you very much uh, for uh, being on tonight. And if, if anyone has any questions and want to get a hold of Chase, uh, we'll have his uh, contact information and we'll get you in touch. And uh, thank you very much uh, tonight. And Marcus, cool. thanks for joining us also from out west. Um, real quick, I would just like to add, um, I hate to throw Marcus under the bus, but if you guys need another presentation, we have some other ones like our walleye production. I know it's away from your – uh, bird counts and your bird surveys and all that. But if you guys need any presentations, I bet Marcus would probably be gladly to give a presentation. <laughs> we'll, so, we'll keep that in mind. We'll keep that yep. in mind. Of course. Well, thank thanks. you very much. I appreciate it. Yep. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you. Yep. Thank Have you, Mark. Good, good program. Everybody. Nice program. Great program. Very yes. good. Lots thank of you. info. Thank you. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Have a great night, guys. Eat plenty of roughage. <laughs> <laughs> Muscles. <laughs>